New Jersey is leading the nation's fight against the opioid epidemic. Lawmakers fast-tracked and the governor signed historic legislation to help curb addiction. And the U.S. attorneys added judicial clout by prosecuting one of the nation's largest pharmaceutical distributors for, quote, turning a blind eye to suspicious oxy and hydrocodone orders. McKesson will pay $150 million in penalties and halt sales of opiates at distribution centers in four states. I recently asked U.S. Attorney Paul Fishman about the significance of the case and the penalty. It's not just the money. Um, there are uh, three or four major wholesalers of controlled substances in the United States that, that distribute them to pharmacies all across the country. And the DEA, the federal government, has imposed an obligation on those companies to make sure that they monitor what are called, that they file what are called suspicious order reports. When they see pharmacies or chains of pharmacies ordering amounts of a substance that should raise eyebrows, they have an obligation to report that to the DEA. McKesson knew that. Um, they had been sanctioned by the DEA for not doing it well enough in, in 2008. And over the course of time, they implemented a compliance program, but just really didn't follow it. As a result, um, they really weren't honoring their legal obligations. And now, um, on my office and a bunch of U.S. attorneys' offices around the country have said, that's not okay. And we've settled with McKesson for $150 million, imposed a whole new compliance regime, and they will have a court-appointed monitor for five years to, to make sure that they're actually doing what they're supposed to do. Many prescription drug addictions begin with doctors prescriptions. So is the, is the problem with the pharmas or with the doctors? Well, I, I, I don't think you can blame only one set of folks. Um, you know, we, we have 5% of the world's population. We prescribe 75% of the world's painkillers. That's a stunning statistic. Um, and so one of the things we have to do is take a look at the way people are prescribing. We have to take a look at the, the information doctors have access to about whether patients have been somewhere else. We have to do better at having doctors pay attention to what their patients are doing after they see them. Um, we have to do better education of people in medical school. I've been in, for the last three or four years, I've been out speaking at to all of the hospital associations in New Jersey, to the, to the New Jersey Hospital Association. I've done grand rounds at Rutgers to the medical school. I've spoken to all the doctors at Hackensack Hospital and Deborah Hospital. I'm supposed to go to Cooper and St. Joe's in the next two months to, to basically give them the perspective of those of us in law enforcement that they can and should do more. This new law that will limit prescriptions and expand treatment options for uh, people who are addicted, um, it, would you call that more than a good start? Well, I, th I, think, it's, I think it's a very important piece of the puzzle, um, but there needs, to be a, there needs to be a lot of things that have to happen. One thing is enforcement, criminal enforcement, against doctors and pharmacists and others who are contributing to the problem. In my office, we've prosecuted um, probably a half a dozen doctors and a half a dozen pharmacists, most recently of the, the, the pharmacists who owned the, the Medford and Old Medford pharmacies in South Jersey for participating in schemes to illegally distribute oxycodone and other painkillers. Um, in addition, we have to be embarked on a real public education campaign. Starting in 2011 or 2012, my office hosted two summits, bringing together educators, people in law enforcement, people in medicine, to get together and talk about how we can do better collectively. We have to do better explaining this to, to parents and kids, and of course, the, the piece that the coaches. that the, the coaches exactly the piece that the legislature and the governor enacted this week is an important part of the puzzle. The treatment that the, that they're going to do, the you know, having inpatient treatment, also really important. All of it has to work together to try to really put a stop to this terrible epidemic. Let's talk about uh, Newark law enforcement. A federal monitor was brought in to oversee the police right. department after uh, clear violations of civil rights were demonstrated over time. How is that going? So I, I think it's going. I think it's going pretty well. Um, we spent my office and, and our colleagues in the Department of Justice in Washington, the Civil Rights Division, spent three years taking a look, a hard mm -hmm. look at the Newark Police Department. Um, I, what we found was partly what I knew to be true, which is that most of the men and women who put on the badge at, in Newark are cops who took those jobs for exactly the right reason. But over time. Some things have happened to the culture of the police department in some ways. Part of it is training. Part of it is resources. And so we agreed with the city. We signed a consent decree with the city right. last spring to, to bring real transformative change to the police department so that the cops on the beat can do their jobs the way they want to and better. What about community involvement? So the, we... we during the course of the investigation, we were out of the community a lot, soliciting community input on what the community perceived the problems to be. And part of it is the police and the community are not in touch with each other in a way that really it will, la will lead to real relationships that matter. Um, and now, now that we have the, the monitor, the part of the monitor's charter is to go out and talk to people in the community, make sure the community has input into the changes that are taking place, and more important, 
um, is, is available to the monitor to say some of the changes are working, some of them are not. Here's what we think should happen. Newark has declared itself a sanctuary city, as have others around the state. Uh, does that carry any legal weight, and have you received any guidelines from the Trump administration about how to handle sanctuary cities in light of the immigration order? So, first of all, it's not clear that it would be in the lane of the U.S. Attorney's Office anyway. There's been a longstanding um, d um, federal executive branch policy that, that cities are free to engage in a voluntary agreement with um, the federal government to decide that they want to em embark on some law enforcement on behalf of the federal government. It's been a voluntary program. Um, so far, there's been no guidance that's going to go anywhere beyond that yet from the, from, the new, from the new administration. Paul Fishman, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me.